Hey guys and gals, welcome to Boomer TV, the variety show. I'm Andy Asher. Now, if there is one thing that we strive for at uh, Bloomer Boomer, it's finding just amazing guests and thought leaders who help all of us solve life's most perplexing problems. And, and in a curious way, many problems revolve around our search for happiness, and that's what it seems like to me. There are a few other visionaries with a more eternal message than Gary M. Douglas and his reminder that happiness is just a choice. Life can be easy. Happiness and ease don't have to come with slog and pain. You know, in a moment, we are going to talk to Gary, who is a, an internationally recognized uh, thought leader. He's a, a best-selling author, a, a business innovator, and founder of Access Consciousness. But first, welcome to July, and we have a huge month ahead for July. Some phenomenal guests. Uh, you can learn more about uh, the upcoming shows in our newsletter, or you can also connect with us on, on Facebook, uh, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and Bloomer Boomer, where we live stream all the shows. You know, and like and follow us on your, uh, on your uh, favorite social media to hear more about uh, what's coming up and all that sort of good stuff. And in the meantime, we will get started with Gary, but first, remember, I love marmalade. <laughs> Well, Gary Douglas, it is so great having you here today. I have I have so many questions uh, that I that I you know things that that I want to ask you, but it's great having you here. Thank you. It's nice to be here, and I love marmalade too. Do, oh, oh, I tell you, and it's it's so it, it, there's so many different ones that have just a very various difference in flavor, and you can experiment and test with, and you can make them at home, too. So that's what I like. But but first, let me ask you, you know, this pandemic is such a huge life changer. You know, it's changed my life in so many ways, and probably more ways than I will ever know. In fact, I am still trying to process all that has happened. Uh, what's it been like for you? It's been horrifying. I had to stay home. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's an adjustment, isn't it? Yes, it's a huge adjustment. And for me, it's like, it's not just the staying home, it's the fact that I don't get to travel to all these different countries. But it has been good in the sense that all the access people have become so creative because they're trying to find ways to create more during this time when we're stuck, quote unquote, at home. Well, that's something what we all have to do, and I, 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 that's good to realize that. And I know, Gary, you have such a huge following, and I'm, I'm just wondering, what is it about your message that so many people have found engaging and meaningful in their life? Well, primarily, I'd say the main thing is to, you know, that with what I talk about, I'm not interested in you being wrong, okay? Most... Most of the things I was involved in before Access would tell me where I was wrong and how I needed to change that. I don't see that anything you do is wrong. I see that everything you do is a choice. And what is your choice creating for you? And if you begin to realize that choice is what creates everything in our lives, what choices have you made that have turned out badly? What choices have you made that turned out great? What choices have you made? But they're all choices. The main thing is to get your choice creates your reality, not reality creates your choice. I like that. And, and, you know, I would love to know more about you, like, you know, and you just briefly referenced that, but like how you developed your message and beliefs. Uh, you know, what was it? Uh, was it something perhaps that came over time or was there something that you saw that was needed in society today? Uh, how did that all come about? It was everything that I saw come together over time. I was in, you know, it's like I tried, tried every church, cult, and religious known to mankind, I think. You know, and if I missed one, I apologize. But, yeah. you know, I, I wow. went everywhere looking for an answer. And what I began to realize in looking for the answer is that there was no one answer that was correct. And I went, what is it that's missing? And when I, all of a sudden I found out that it was the question. 
It's not the answer that gets you where you want to go. It's the question that gets you where you want to go. So if you ask a question, the universe will do everything it can to give you the answer. But we, if we ask for, if we ask for an answer, then anything that doesn't match the answer we've decided is the right answer cannot even come into our awareness. So we cut off a whole lot of our awareness in order to believe in something. And it's like if you, you know, it's like I don't ask people to believe in me. I ask people to question me. I ask people to question access and to look at access and see what works and use that. And if it doesn't work for them, don't do it. You know, I don't, I, I was involved in cults and stuff. And it's like, I mean, everybody was supposed to be a follower. And if you didn't do what the head guy said, then you were bad and wrong. And I went, I'm not going to be one of those. I am not interested in that. Yeah. I figure, you know, I got enough work to handle my own life, let alone trying to handle anybody else's. So how can I have the right answer? Yeah. How can I have the right question is what I came to. And I love looking at the question. What question can I ask here that would open the door to a greater possibility? And that's the way I function in life. I'm always looking for a question I can ask that will open the door to a greater possibility than I ever thought was possible. And that's what's happened with, you know, the COVID thing. It's like, I see all kinds of people having a problem with it. And I go, why? You know, it's like, what's really true? You know, and it's like, and I question everything. Cause it's like, I, I grew up in the sixties. So, you know, it was question authority. I figure anybody tells me this is what's so, then I better question it because they're trying to be an authority. So with the, you know, the numbers of people that have died from COVID, I go, okay, so what percentage of the population is that? And it's like, it's such a small percentage of the population. It's not like with the Spanish flu of 1918 or whatever it was, yeah. where it's like people, 50 million people died in that. We've had a few hundred thousand die with this with a six billion population on the planet. Uh, how bad is this? And the other thing is, it's like you look at some of the countries who don't do the quarantining stuff and they, you know, they have less numbers than all the people who do the quarantining. And it's just bizarre to me that we are functioning from this when in actuality we should be questioning it. Yeah, you know, and you bring up a, a very thought-provoking uh, idea, what you call, you know, the possibilities after COVID-19. You call yes. it the gift in a corona pandemic. You know, I too have given that a lot of thought in the way I'm wondering what life will uh, be like again when we settle into whatever that new normal is. So. You know, let me ask you, because it, it sounds like uh, you have, you know, like you obviously have some visions about that. Well, it's like one of the things that's been great about it is the fact that they've had so much change in the ecology of the planet. You know, it's like they've had, you know, thousands of flamingos settle in the harbor in Venice. They've had, they've had swans they've had dolphins they've had all kinds of things happening in the harbors of venice which haven't gone on for a long time because of the constant state of movement of the boats and the the people and the the uh the gondolas <laughs> the gondola. gondolas don't put out that much but the the other boats do you know it's like they have a lot of a lot of speed boats that you know they reverse their engines and so do stir up the the bottom of the thing and they're saying that you can see fish in the channels in venice now they've you know the first time in 30 years they can see the himalayas in india or you know it's that it's like I saw a picture of Los Angeles and it had clear skies, clear blue skies. And it's like, I went, wow, I haven't seen that since 1962. Yeah. How about that? Clear skies in Los Angeles. That's, yeah. a, that's a rarity, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And so it's like all of these things that we thought, you know, and there were pictures of, you know, wallabies 
going through the streets of Australia and coyotes in the streets of San Francisco. And, you know, it's like animals are coming back into being part of our ecology. And animals should have always been part of our ecology, not something that was separate and not something that we didn't, you know, we didn't value. Yeah. Well, Gary, oh. okay, I, I'm going to throw out my own theory. You can tell me if I'm crazy, but I'm wondering what you think about it. Your, your okay. message you know, seems to help us uh, better define in the Judeo-Christian ethic that underpins so much of America, you know, our politics, our law, and our morals since the 1940s, because I feel to a large extent those values uh, maybe make us struggle with achieving happiness. What do you think? Is that craziness, or does it make any sense to you? Well, it's like what we've been what has been promoted to us is that happiness is comes from falling in line and being in step with everybody else. I don't think that's correct. Yeah, and, and that's very that's real close to the to what the what that whole philosophy is. You know, and I've been I've been following you on Facebook, and you know, one of your posts really cracked me up. You wrote, "Be bad. It's way more fun than being good." Now, I, I, I get it. You know, to me, it means as long as you are not hurting anyone else, it's okay. Now. I'm sure that you have a different, if not a much better story behind it, uh, but it really got my interest. Well, it's like the thing about being good. When you try to be good, you actually have to judge yourself more. When you're being bad, you're doing what you really want to do, eating what you really want to eat, drinking what you really want to drink, and eating who you want to eat, and it's just a choice. You know, And you should have that choice in your life, that place where you can choose something that creates more. And it's just so much greater when you can create more in your own life because you will inspire others to create more in their lives as well. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's really such a, a, a simple uh, outlook on things. You know, we yeah. complicate it, right? Yes, we complicate it by trying to get it right. You know, and it's like, you know, you listen to the politicians and you almost cringe. You know, it's like the difficulty I have with politicians right now is I see very few statesmen and lots of politicians and they're always trying to go with the party line and go with the party line and go with the party line and what if there was no party yeah you know you're not, not you're not alone in that terrible. you know and i sense the underpinning uh message of what you write and what you speak about what, and what to what to strive toward happiness above all else you know tell me happiness is is why we're here in many ways. Why we're why we well, inhabit the earth. My question to people is, okay, so does the bird get up in the morning and go, I'm having a bad feather day. I'm not gonna sing today. No, they get up and they sing. You know, does the animal get up and go, I'm gonna sleep in today because I've collected plenty of nuts? Or do they go out and search around for what else they can gather for their life? You know, it's like we act like we are these sedentary creatures that would be very happy to sit and watch television all day long. Except it's so boring. <laughs> yeah, that's, but, you know, we would also be remiss if we didn't address uh, depression and sadness because uh, it does happen to all of us. And at times like that, uh, we, it doesn't feel nearly as impossible to, uh, or doesn't find as possible for me when I'm feeling like that to find happiness. I have to get myself out of that. One of the things that I do is I ask people, okay, so who does this belong to, this, happy, this unhappiness and this sadness? And it's like, and 98% of the time it doesn't belong to them. It's something they're picking up from somebody else. You know, with little kids, I would say to them, okay, so where, you know, close your eyes and point to where that unhappiness is coming from. And they would always point outside of themselves, never inside themselves. And it's like, and it would be from some neighbor or some other person that they would be picking up this sadness from. And it's like the sadness and the unhappiness and the depression belongs to others. It's like we're all way more psychically aware than we think we are. It's got it's to like, start inside, inside well, us. It has you gotta to you gotta start outside of you, not inside of you. Okay, okay. The problem is people try to start inside themselves to get out of their depression, but the depression isn't actually theirs. It belongs to somebody else uh -huh. that they're picking it up from. I you're see. You're so much more aware than you realize. 
Well, you talk about many things that coincide exactly with what uh, Bloomer Boomer is all about. Ours is embrace life, embrace age, you know, empower dreams. You talk about the art of elegance and how to inject it into your life and beyond uh, problems and yeah. uh, possibilities. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, see, it's like from my point of view, it's like I grew up in a middle, 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 middle class family. Okay. It's like, yeah. And we had, we had furniture that was arranged a particular way in the house. And if it wore out, they would get rid of that furniture, they'd put it in the attic, and they would take and they'd put the new couch in exactly the same place where the old couch had been, a new chair where the old chair had been. And it's like, and we, nothing ever changed. Everything was exactly the same and it stayed that way for my entire life. We moved house at one point and my mother arranged the furniture and it stayed that way for the entire time she lived there. She got new furniture a couple of times and get, replaced the old furniture that had worn out, but she didn't put it in a new place, exactly the same arrangement. And it's like, it's like, wow. You know, it's like, what if everything didn't have to stay the same? And why is it that we think things staying the same is a good idea? You know, I personally like changing my furniture around, although I currently haven't changed my room and around in a while. So I, um, I find it very interesting because I woke up this morning and I thought, you know, maybe I should bring that chair in here and I should do this and I should do this. And I'm going, oh, God, <laughs> yeah, Party change again. I know what you mean. And I think what you are really a success at being is, uh, you know, is being provocative, like, uh, why don't you believe in retirement? You talk about the, you know, the myth of aging. That's, that's a very provocative, relevant thoughts. Well, it's like for me, it's like I watched the people in my neighborhood where I grew up where nothing ever changed. Uh, <laughs> And it's like the people would retire and there was one guy who would sit out in front of his garage all day long in a chair and judge everybody who drove by. And it's like, what? And he was never happy. He was always miserable and unhappy. And he gave his wife orders and she was the sweetest little old lady. And she would just go do stuff, you know, go buy, you know, go get me some of this, go get me some of this, go get me, bring me, me this. And it's like he was just, he gave orders all the time. And he was, you know, had been in the Navy and he thought he was the captain of his ship. And it's like he was not kind. He was not nice. He, you know, and he judged there was a lady across the street and she had two kids. Yeah, that little girl's going to end up getting pregnant by the time she's 18. He was correct. She did. But it wasn't because of the lady, it was because the girl was just an outrageously beautiful girl who wanted to play. And next door neighbor, we had a preacher and his daughter would have sex with anybody from the time she was 15. And it's like, why? Because her father said she couldn't. Oh, okay. Okay. You yeah, know, that's, that's so true. You can't have sex. You're a, uh, you're a virgin. You're going to be a virgin when you get married. She goes, oh, no, I'm not. And she went out and had sex with everybody. Yeah, that's, yeah. The, way that, uh, that's the way that group, that t teenagers and that age group, you know, talk about it. And I know something that, uh, that you talk about is benevolent capitalism, a new way of doing business. And, you know, you were talking about uh, what you were talking about earlier. I, I'm starting to see more and more in the startup environment of, of leaders taking a similar approach uh, to what you've been talking about. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it's like one of the things I noticed is I had people who would ask me to come and help me, help them with their their businesses. And this one guy had a program that was designed to create more consciousness in the world, quote unquote. And uh, he would do these seminars, but he would make all of his employees had to travel to the seminar on their own dime. They had to pay for their own room and they got nothing for free. And, and then he would sit and spend eight hours getting balanced books where everything, every penny was accounted for. And if somebody was 10 cents off, 
he'd make him spend an extra 12 hours to prove where that 10 cents went. I thought, that is just crazy. Wasting that is, A, time. not trusting your people, number one, but number two, not valuing them. You have to value the people that work with you. I do. And it's like lots of people that work with me make over $100,000 a year, most of them. And it's like, I think they're amazing and they do amazing things. And I figure people work with you or they work against you. So you don't, you don't do things against the people that work for you. And this guy was always trying to cut costs by cutting their salaries. And it's like, you know, if you didn't look at, it's like, I don't look at how do I cut salaries and how do I save money? I look at how do I increase revenue? I think that's why what you say has been so widely adopted. And, and earlier I referenced why happiness is just a choice. Life can be easy, happiness and ease don't have to come up with slog and pain. You know, how did you discover that? Actually, by watching the people around me, I saw that all these people were like, they came up with these brilliant answers for their unhappiness, which didn't make them happy. And I was in, I, you know, I went to college and I got a psychology degree and I went, this is just bullshit. These people are saying that they have to handle this terrible problem, but it's like, how did they get a terrible problem? Where did it come from? What creates it? And then I began to realize, wait a minute, we create our own problems. We decide something is a problem, it becomes a problem. We decide something is wrong, it becomes wrong. We decide, so it's our decisions and our judgments and our conclusions that create the place where we cannot thrive and can barely survive. Oh. Just crazy. Mm. And, and you know, as we wind up, let me just ask you about uh, creating, you know, life. Where do you where do you start, and why is it never too late? Because if you can get out of bed in the morning, it's never too late. Simple as that, right? <laughs> simple, simple as that. that. Simple as that. It's simple. You just get up and go. Not too complicated. And, no. and, and talk a little bit about access consciousness. Access is a set of tools and techniques and classes. The classes are all designed to let you move at whatever rate you wish to move to create more in your life and to have more of what you want. And I have people who come to access and they go, oh my God, before access, I was miserable and unhappy and I hated my life. And now I love my life. I'm having a good time. I'm earning more money than I ever had before. And oh my God, what else can I do? And they're always looking for what else is possible. Because if you look from the idea of what else is possible in life, you can only create. You cannot put yourself in the obviation of stupidity. Because, you know, so many people present stupid ideas. And it's just like, really? This is important? Why? I know, I know. Gary, it has been so great talking to you. Any uh, final points that... that uh, we should talk about and also yes. talk about where people through the out. world and be happy as simple <laughs> as that yeah I I, uh, I couldn't agree with you more Gary yeah. thanks so much thank you it was a pleasure it's always a pleasure talking to you sir you're wonderful well uh, thank you That's, it's Gary M uh, Gary M Douglas founder of Access Consciousness you can find out more on Facebook YouTube and on bloomerboomer.com. And if you like this show, please like us on Facebook and follow us uh, on your, your favorite social media channel. Meantime, so long, and remember, I love marmalade.